Tere nõunad ka minu poolt. Mul on ettekandjatega kogu lõpitud, et ma lühidalt neid tutvustan eelnevalt eesti keeles. Kõigepealt Peter Rafferty. Ta on Green Parki alkooli õpetaja Liverpoolist. Kui me oleme viimasele ajal jõudnud aru saamisele, et sellised monoliitsed asud, õppeasudse kesksed õpihaldussüsteemid on oma aja ära elanud, et tuleb üle minna personaalsetele õpihaldussüsteemidele, kus iga õpilane ise saab endale kokku vajalikes teenustest panna sobiliku süsteemi, siis ajaveebid, ehk blogid on siis üks võimalus. Ja tema on seda oma alkoolis väga tõsiselt edendanud ja oppis ja ka palju laiemalt. Kui nüüd voodata veebist, et kuidas ta Piter ennast ise määratleb, siis ma toon välja kaks märksena või nimetust, nimelt Arktika uuria, Arctic Explorer ja International Spy. Mina tean, mida ta selle ajal mõtles. Võibolla... Do I need to explain? Yeah, please. You can start, please. Okay. First of all, I guess the international spy bit is quite important to explain. My normal job is I'm a primary school teacher in a small school just outside of Liverpool. And I work for two days a week in that school. For the other three days, I come on adventures like this one. And I travel to places like Spain and Portugal, places in the UK and to Tallinn. And sometimes I have to explain to the children particularly on weeks when I'm not in school, that I'm going somewhere else. And the easiest explanation for them is to say that I'm an international spy going on a mission. <laughs> and I think they believe me, because whenever I say I'm off next week, they say, are you going to tell them you're an international spy on a mission? And I just say, shh, you can't say anything. I'm an Arctic explorer because two years ago, my wife and I went on a cruise and we passed the Arctic Circle and we were in the Arctic Ocean. So I can actually put down on my social media profile that I'm an Arctic explorer. So international spy, an Arctic explorer. One thing that doing the job that I do is really good for me is I find out what other people are doing, other schools, other countries. And I arrived on Wednesday night about half past 10 in Tallinn. And I was disappointed because on Thursday morning, I heard all about the pre-conference with the students. And I would have loved to have been there on Wednesday to see the pre-conference because I thought it was a fabulous idea. And there was two words that were well, two sentences that I picked out. Sorry, just to explain as well. I love technology. I use technology all the time. If I don't have my phone in my pocket and it's charged, I, got, I get stressed about it. But I still use pencil and I still use paper. And I was sitting yesterday in the conference hall, listening to different people, talking about the technology that, that they use, and I wrote notes down. So before I talk anything about that stuff up there, I just want to mention some of the things which I, I personally found fascinating and which comes into a little bit in what I'm talking about uh, to do with using blogging and using Google Apps in our school. And the first thing which was somebody mentioned yesterday was they were running on 10% battery time. I think it was Mark, wasn't it? 10% battery time. I had a similar experience about 10 minutes ago with the two guys who were sitting on the desk over there because they said to me, you've got 38 minutes to talk and seven minutes to answer questions. And if you've ever been in my class, giving a time limit of 38 minutes and seven minutes sometimes doesn't work, okay? because it's Friday and my children like to go out to playtime on a Friday afternoon. That's okay. But the pre-conference messages that I got and I wrote down yesterday were that the students, as part of that process, were engaged. And the other thing that they said, which I wrote down, is that they wanted to encourage teachers to be innovative. 
to try out different things because they wanted to learn. And some of the things that you'll see in this presentation here is a little bit about the way in our school, in our town, in our country, we've managed in some cases to get things right. We don't always. Sometimes things go wrong, but this is a bit of a story about what we've used and how we've engaged children in the digital world. The second thing I noticed was the lady from Australia, Liz from Australia. She was talking about the way that she's changing Newcastle University in Sydney, in Newcastle, and changing the way that students react. So rather than have a room like this, where everybody's sitting facing the front and facing the teacher, she's implementing great change in the way that not only that the place looks, but the way that her students learn as well. And again, it rang a bell with me in the way that we've done something in our school. She used the phrase, sitting on stairs. And as soon as she said sitting on stairs, she's got this plan of having part of her room, a set of stairs in which the students can sit, talk to each other, and continue their learning. You'll see what well, the connection, as soon as she said that yesterday, it had with me. Uh, Steve Williams, Professor Steve Williams, talked about web-based learning. And we've kind of like we feel been doing that for 10 years. Something else happened 10 years ago. Something very important happened 10 years ago. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. You'll see that straight away. Much more important than technology and education. Something happened 10 years ago. Very important. Okay, you'll see. Uh, barriers. It was mentioned. Steve Williams mentioned also barriers and the fact that teachers find digital literacy teachers, some of the barriers that they came across in their study with Cumbria University and Newcastle University in the United Kingdom, that teachers had barriers, digital literacy barriers. And sometimes getting over those barriers is a way of making things better for the students. Also spoke about a portfolio. When you work in the digital world, you leave behind you a portfolio. Some call it a digital footprint. And the digital footprint that you leave behind your portfolio works really well when you go back over the years and you find out that there are things that you've done and pupils have done which make a difference. All of yesterday, when I was sitting there watching other people present, I was thinking to myself in my head, these things I can do at home in school. And, and then the thing that strikes me, particularly about having all these ideas come to you, is that if you try to do everything all at once, you end up not doing anything. So I always go back and just try and take one thing with me that I can use back in my own school with my own teaching and my own students. And the one thing that struck me yesterday was uh, David's App Inventor. I've kind of like, I won the prize by the way, it, was, it wasn't fixed, it wasn't fixed. I won the prize of the book, and I know that next week when I go back into school, if I can get my hands on the devices, because there's arguments in our school about who has the devices and when, that it's a really great tool to make a start on doing something else which we're already doing. Take it to the next step. And then I was talking to somebody this morning, and I don't know if I can see his face in the audience, but he's the guy from Boston. He asks all the questions. I, that's you, there you are. And I wrote down a phrase um, from the guy from Boston. I can't remember your first name. The guy from Boston. And he spoke about a lava of opportunity. And again, when you see the, pretty much the last slide, you'll see why I wrote down the lava of opportunity and I recorded it in my book. And the last thing is that lots of people have said, as we've been walking about and we've been chatting to different people, which university are you from? Are you a professor? and I'm not from a university, and I'm not a professor, I'm just a primary school teacher in the United Kingdom in England. But we use digital stuff from little kids to big kids. We spoke one, just before I launched into it, um, and I wasn't going to show you this slide until about ooh, half past 10 this morning, where I added this slide to my presentation. We were talking yesterday about flipped learning. And in the flipped learning, which I've started to do in the last six months, and it's made a difference, this information piece here kind of like sums up this room at the moment. And I talk to my older students, the oldest ones in our school are 11 years old, 
but I use this with our students and I get them to describe themselves when they're listening to me talking in class. And it is a very simple, straightforward description of what a classroom could be like using the conventional system. Because according to this, of 20 students in a class, so multiply it by however many people here, there's one person in the room who will already know what I'm talking about. So the question is, what are they doing here? They might as well go outside and enjoy the, I was going to say sunshine, slightly rainy weather. There's two people in the, in the class of 20 who are really engaged with what you're saying. They're there for a reason, and the reason is that they're learning. But it gets a bit worse as we go on. Three people in the room are kind of like listening. They're not quite sure what's going on. They'd like to ask a question, but they're reluctant to put their hand up and say, but what does that mean? In case in, fr in front of all their friends, they look a little bit foolish or they, they, they show up a misunderstanding which they don't want to see. But as we move down, it gets slightly worse. The, the four yellow people are trying to keep up. They're listening, they're doing the best, but they only understand a small percentage of what's going on and they don't really want to ask at all. It's not that they're thinking of asking, they just understand a little bit and that's it. But we go to the top row and we've got nearly a quarter of the class and I kind of like could look around this room now and see that a quarter of this room here is passively disengaged. That means they're kind of like looking at me but thinking, I can't wait to go to the pub tonight, you know? And it works like that in our own class. And we talk to our students in our school about that very thing. The ones who are looking at you, you're convinced as a teacher, they know they are listening to you and they are paying attention and they are doing all the things a student could do, but they're not really. And then the other quarter, the actively disengaged the ones who are flicking somebody else or doing something. Or, as I was caught out yesterday, um, somebody asked me a question. It was Marina and Yuri. They asked me a question just at that point when I was texting my wife about a kitchen that we're having fitted back in the UK. And it's the kind of actively disengaged things that kids with technology do. And I, st I was asked a question and I didn't know what the answer was because I was on the phone. And I was one of the actively disengaged. Not, uh, not on purpose, by the way. It was an important question. We've got to transfer money from one account to the other. Otherwise, this guy won't do me kitchen. Okay? So that is, um, that is how we start. And again, it comes back to this thing we were talking about yesterday. Flip learning. And flip learning can make a difference. And I've already run out of about seven minutes of, uh, of, of, of quite a lot. Okay? Cool. So, here we go. And this is a picture from uh, a film that I really like. It's called, I can't remember what it's called. Can't remember what the film's called. It'll come to me anyway. But the reason I like it is because education and technology in, in education reminds me of this picture. Because you're always faced with a, with a what are they doing? Looking at the two people. And which way should I go? And it's almost like that every time you make a decision, somebody else somewhere has made a different decision, which makes you think, oh, I wish I'd have done that. Or, alternatively, you make the decision, and the decision that you make is the right decision, and it works for you, and it works for your school, and it works for your pupils. And I'm still trying to think of the name of the film, but I can't. Okay? If anybody can help me at this point, uh, it's Cary Grant's in it, Alfred Hitchcock directed it, and North by Northwest. It's a film called North by Northwest, okay? Uh, and both of them are not quite sure what the other is about to do. And in our own school, in our own education, days are like that. I pinched this slide, and this explains a little bit about what we try to do in our school from a guy from Finland, but I asked him if I could pinch his slide. He was doing a presentation about three weeks ago, and he was speaking about 21st century skills. And first of all, 
I liked the little bubbles, but I didn't like the title 21st century skills because certainly in my school, every single child in our school was born well into the 21st century. So the only skills that they can learn are 21st century skills. We wouldn't be teaching them 20th century skills. So I kind of like don't like the title, but I do like the little bubbles inside. The ones which say digital citizenship, critical thinking, individual and global perspectives, creativity and innovation, and communication and collaboration. And we feel in our school, with what we do, that we do all of those kinds of things because of blogging and because of the way we use Google Apps for Education. And this is, again, to pinch a, so a title from a song in a film, these are a few of my favorite things. And this, perhaps, is my favorite picture of the last two or three years in our school. Because we were talking yesterday about the way that learning areas are structured, whether you want to sit at a desk, face the teacher, and listen. Well, with this is, a, this is our, these are our year ones. They are five and six years old. And if you look carefully, you can see that they have two different devices. One device is a device which we have in our school called the Chromebook. They're cheap. We're quite a cheap school. We go for the cheapest, sort of. Um, and they're very easy to use. They're very light, and the children can carry them. The other devices that you can see in there are iPad minis. And in that class there, of children sitting around the teacher one set of children, half of the class, were using the Google account to share their documents that they had created. And the other half of the children, the children with the iPads, are actually doing uh, some coding on a, an app called Codable. And it's a great way to start coding. And in one class with two adults, and everybody sat around on the floor, it worked. And it's a really good example, I think, and it's my favorite picture, of how learning with technology in a space can work successfully. And incidentally, when we were talking about uh, stirs and learning spaces yesterday, oh, okay, sorry, this is the title one. This is where I should have started, but I added extra slides in. So it's teaching and learning with um, blogs and Google apps for education. Just get rid of that. But the next picture, oh, sorry, yeah. Remember I said about portfolios and digital footprints? I was preparing this, this presentation last week, and in my Google Drive, I came across some work that I did in 2012, where we pushed out an online Google form to all the students in our school, pupils, from whatever age, 11 to sort of the five and six-year-olds, with the help of their teachers in some cases, and they answered the questions that we'd set for them about the way that ICT was used in our school. So this is 2012, and I found it last week, or refound it. And once you've got all the answers, you can just copy and paste all of those answers into a, an online tool called Wordle, and Wordle then puts it into I don't know how it does it, does it some way, puts it into order of prior priority, order of importance. So the more that a word is said in the answers, the, more, the, the bigger the word appears in your wordle. And that's kind of like, when I look at it in 2012, a really positive feeling you get from IT in your school. I think if I ask the same questions today, and did the same Wordle today, you would see things change. And when I was looking at it, in the top right corner, in green, you've got apps. I think today, apps would be a big word. I still think you'd get the sense of fun, and you'd get, thank you, thank you, thank you. Who's point who's the, excellent, thank you. Okay, yeah, lovely. Okay, lovely. So there is apps up at the top there. Um, I don't think computers would appear so largely in our school because we haven't got any. We've got Chromebooks and we've got iPads, but we don't have any computers. Um, learning, I still think, would appear. And there was one, um, uh, there's, there was one other which um, I think, I can't, I, can't, I can't remember which it was. Doesn't matter. 
But I think, but that's a good example of how you can reflect the way that uh, IT is used in your school and also the way to put it together so it's visually quite appealing thing to see. 2005, remember I said something very important happened 10 years ago? 2005 Champions League final. Every time, everywhere I go and everything I do, everything comes back to football. And although it was important for Liverpool and us, and I did wake up the following morning with a very big hangover, much worse than you had. <laughs> um, it was also the year that we started blogging, our school started blogging. Um, so the two go together very nicely. And when we started our school blog in 2005, it changed the way that we did things. And it changed the way that the teachers did things. And it changed the way the pupils did things. And it changed the way that people in our community saw our school because they saw what was going on inside of our school. And it also engaged us with the world. And I've got a picture, I think it's the next one, which shows you currently, um, if you look at the top right hand corner there, it's not very clear on there, but I've just, uh, there you go, that little map there, if you look really closely, oh and by the way, if you want this presentation, it's on Twitter, if you follow me on Twitter somewhere, it's, uh, I'll, my Twitter handle comes along a little later on. If you go to my Twitter feed, all of this presentation is there, so you can access it and you get all the links that are there and that you can see. Um, and up there at the top is got the current map of visitors to our blog. And for some reason, if you look at South America, we're quite popular in South America for some reason. I haven't got a clue why, but we get lots and lots of visitors from South America. And this is us, and we're Green Park Primary School, and we're in a small town just on the edge of um, Liverpool called McGull. Our web address is greenparkschool.org.uk, and our Twitter feed is at Green Park School, so you can keep in touch with us. We were talking about stairs yesterday, and how Liz from Australia is putting stairs in. And she doesn't know at the moment what to call that learning area. She came up with one, a, a, a buffer, a banquet, I think it was. I think what was one of the terms. But she hadn't quite decided, or they hadn't quite decided, on what to call the learning space. And what you can see behind you there used to be our ICT room. And it used to be a rectangular room. And it used to have computers on one side and computers on the other side. And the computers were old and they were slow and all the kids hated going into the computer suite because it was horrible and the computers were slow and it just wasn't very good. So, our, we're lucky in our school because we have a caretaker and our caretaker can make things. He makes all kinds of things. He makes pirate boats out of wood and they're really tremendous, but he can make things. And so we had this plan, he and I together, that without telling anybody, we were going to convert our ICT suite from an ICT suite into something else. And we weren't going to tell anybody in school, we were just going to do it. Well, the week before we had our plans, I told our head teacher, and she was fine with it. And what we did with our computer suite is we took out all of the computers and got rid of them. We then painted the walls, and then, because Mike can do things like this, he made those steps that you can see in the picture. And we carpeted the floor, and we put the carpet on the steps. And as we were making this, and we did it in the school holidays, it was the half-term holidays about 18 months ago, we started calling it, because it was so different, the beautiful room. And when the children came back after the holidays, we carried on, Mike, that's the caretaker and I, carried on using the phrase, the beautiful room, which we did do. And if you go into our school today, if you sort of got into, got into the plane, landed in Liverpool, went to our school, and you said to any child in our school, what's that room in there? They would answer you, the beautiful room. And it works. And now we've transformed it from this horrible old room with old slow computers to a room that's got steps on one side, and on the other side, we've got a big screen TV, and we've connected Apple TV to it, and now it's gone from a room which nobody liked to go into to a room which people use for lots of different reasons, not just IT. 
because the IT now is mobile, can go anywhere in the school, iPads, Chromebooks, doesn't matter. If you need to go in there, you can do, but it's used for other things as well. And it cost us two and a half thousand euros because Mike can make things, okay? So that's our beautiful room in our school. I still haven't come to blogs, but I'm coming there now. Once we'd started our blog in 2005, as I say, it transformed the way that the teachers and the pupils approached IT. Their skills, without trying, went up like that. And we had one day a, a, a lady come in, her name's Zoe Ross. In the United Kingdom, she's pretty important. She works for the DfE on the new computing and coding side of the... She runs a course, David, called Barefoot Computing, and it's a really good one to get started with. Loads of resources for coding for little ones. But she came into our school one Monday afternoon, and she came into our class, and some of our children just talked about the blogs that they were running themselves. We had this project where I gave them blogs and let them look after them, and they looked after them fine. And with a couple of things that she said, if, if you get this presentation and you click on that piece of paper, it takes you to the full article. But I took out a couple of uh, sections about what Zoe said, about uh, what she came across. And they made me very proud, but they reflected much better on the children and how they did. She said, they made me view things differently and see previously unknown possibilities. That, for me, is the purpose of education. And at the time, this online blog, I think it was then, was a blog for high-powered people in the education world. And some very high-powered people in the United Kingdom wrote for the purpose of education, Zoe being one of them. And she also wrote... Um, and we go back to those 21st century learning skills about being creative and being critical thinkers and being um, collaborating and communicating and all of those things that she said, giving young people and adults the confidence to think for themselves, challenging widely held opinions and present their ideas in a coherent, persuasive manner are all, in my view, key purposes of education. And this was great. You know, it reflects really well on them. But I think the really good thing about blogs, and these are eight and nine year old children who were involved in this uh, day, the really good thing about it was that generating the idea that children can take part and children can do these things. The really pleasing thing about this was that of course with blogs you can leave comments and the conversation carries on. And once Zoe had written this piece, and once she'd published it in this online, high-powered purpose of education, some people, high-powered people, left comments saying their thoughts and opinions. Well, in my class at the time, there was a little girl called Lily. And Lily's lovely, and she likes to use technology uh, quite a lot. But one night, when I was looking through the comments that had been left, Lily suddenly popped up. So we've got now an eight-year-old girl joining in digitally, confidently, coherently with the high-powered people of UK Educational. And Lily's comment was great. March the 2nd, 2011, at 7.37 p.m., Lily said, Dear Zoe, thanks for coming into our class to talk to us. I hope you enjoyed coming in. I also hope that you can come again. If you come again, could you show us more computer skills? Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Bye from Lillian Year 4. And that's a lovely message. It's somebody joining in with a conversation with the real world in a real setting. And Zoe, of course, replied back. Hi, Lily. Great to hear from you. I really enjoyed you coming in to see you all very much and look forward to seeing you again if Mr. Rafferty lets me come in. I think of you every time I hear Katy Perry's firework song. And that was great for Lily. And it was also great for the way that we did things in school. And we had, as I said just a minute ago, we had this sort of, it wasn't an experiment. Sometimes I do things in school and I don't always tell everybody what I'm doing. And I set up blogs for my class. I got parents' permission to say that they could have them. And we set up one whole class blog and we set up a blog for each person who wanted to be involved. And about 70% of children got their own class blog but everybody contributed to this uh, blog here, which was the class blog. 
And we started this because in the summer term, what we used to do in our school, that every person in key stage two, that's year six, year five, year four, and year three, they all were given a project to do over the summer months, which they researched in school, they researched at home, they wrote it or they printed it out, they sent it into the teacher, the teacher would plow through these 30 projects and would make a comment, a set of comments about an A4 page long, and the only people who got to see these projects were the person who wrote it, the mums and dads who helped them with the project, and the teacher, and that was it. So I ended up uh, in the summer term in year four, and I said, well, we'll do our projects on the blog instead. And there was one little boy, his name is Reese, and he's, he's a delightful child. You would have him in your class any day of the week. And I was um, working not in class, but outside class, and I was going through their blogs, and I came across Reese's blog. And he and his dad had found this online publishing tool called My eBooks. And Reese, uh, and the project, which was about, was about um, what school was like now, what school was like when your mums and dads were at school, and what school was like when your grand grannies and granddads were in school. And in Reese's blog, he'd found my ebook. And it's a wonderful creation. And the only thing that I'm disappointed with today is I can't show you with it, because no matter where me and his parents, because I asked them before I came out, where his book is now, we can't find it anywhere. And the shame about it is, because when I wrote this particular blog piece, for, a, for somebody else, at the time, Reese's ebook about his mum's school life, his, dad, uh, his granddad's school life, and his own school life, at the time of writing this, had had 7,000 views. The last time I looked, it had gone up to 52,000 views of one ebook written and created by Reese and his dad. And you can tell his dad's involved just by looking at the quality of the book. But nonetheless, somebody sitting in a small school in a small town just outside Liverpool had got 52,000 views of, of his ebook. And again, it's, it's an example of the digital world allowing pupils to demonstrate those 21st century skills properly and in a real setting. Oh. Google Apps, then Google Apps came along and we were happy as Larry blogging as our class and suddenly I discovered Google Apps for Education. And if you've not used it, it's great for a th uh, three reasons. It's free, doesn't cost a penny, it's easy to use and as a teacher, and if anybody is a teacher here, they will know that given something complicated technologically, it doesn't get used. But Google Apps gets used all the time because it's free and it's easy to use. And as a, the administrator of Google Apps for Education in our school, it's even easier to administer, okay? And the reason it was, uh, the reason it came along when the kids were blogging and the kids suddenly in my class found that they could send emails to each other, they could instant message e uh, each other, and they could also do video chats with each other. And it was kind of like, woohoo, we've been let loose. And it was great. We got parents' permission to say that they could have a Google account. We ensured that e-safety came as our priority. The children knew what to do if they came across anything or if anyone suggested anything, and they didn't. But the interesting thing is no matter, not no matter, although I mentioned it in school quite often, Google Apps for Education, Teachers didn't really catch on at all. It was, re the, it was really the pupils who were the drivers of this bit of technology. Um, and they used it to great effect. And the, the one thing, if you don't know about Google Apps, what it lets you do um, is collaborate with lots of other people wherever they are in the world, as long as they are internet connected. And in real time, you can share a document of all kinds. This, this presentation I've got has been done on Google Slides, and I can share this with anybody in the world, and if I really want to, I can let them change any content which is on there, if I wanted to. But the thing was about Google Apps for Education, apart from being free, easy to use, and, um, and 
driven by the pupils. It also moved up our standards as well. And I'm not going to show you this, although if you get, if you get this presentation by going on my Twitter link, uh, you'll get this presentation. It's done by a kid called Ryan Hughes. And Ryan Hughes hates writing. If you opened his book, his writing book, he's in year six now, he was in year four. He, uh, in his writing book, his handwriting is dreadful. He hates writing. And one afternoon in year four, we were writing. And tears were coming down his, his eyes because he was finding the writing that we were doing difficult. So I just said to him, look, Ryan, go and get yourself a computer and go in your Google account and create something in which you're interested. And he created this particular presentation. And if you get the opportunity, go on it because the difference between his digital presentation and the difference between his written pre presentation is amazing. You wouldn't think it was the same person doing the same thing. And it enabled him not to get stuck with the problems that were causing him difficulties. You know? Uh, we started doing our homework. Again, we're using Google applications. Don't really know I'm sh why I'm showing you this, but the, 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 the big thing about it is that using Google um, using Google Apps for Education, the children now, because things have come on since 2011, can use any device at any time. And as we give out homework using Google Forms, of which if you click on that link, if you've got the presentation, you can actually do our homework if you wanted to. And we don't get any excuses from the children. In the United Kingdom, if you don't give your homework in, a common excuse is you say, I haven't got my homework, the dog ate it. Okay. Well, you can't do that now because you do it online. And it works very well. The big difference, the change, as I say, the, the, the pupils drove this, and it was easy, it was easy for them to use, and it is today. Um, and I know that is because in the admin console that I have, I can see who uses it and when. I've got three, is that three minutes and 30 seconds. Right, I'll speed up. OK, um, end of year reports. It, the, the, the reason that the teachers became, this became embedded, using Google Apps for Education became embedded was when we came to do reports. And we had one class, our year three class, two teachers, both had young children, and both shared the class. So Maria used to come in, one of the teachers, Monday, Tuesday, until Wednesday afternoon, and Judith came in from Wednesday afternoon until Friday. They shared the class. And when they wrote their end of year reports, they wrote it on Microsoft Word, one had a memory stick, did those bits of the reports, 30 reports, they take hours and hours and hours. If Estonian reports are like the UK reports, they take hours. And they went, uh, so one would do the reports, take them home, add their bit, pass the memory stick over, live in fear of not overwriting what had been written before, do their bit, pass the memory stick back, and they'd be living in fear of overwriting or losing the memory stick. So one night, I showed Maria 10 minutes of you can do this using Google Apps, real-time collaboration. And another night when Judith was in, did exactly the same. And these two teachers, these two teachers now live their lives completely on Google Apps for Education because it enables their work. It's technology making the job of a teacher easier. It makes the job of the teacher easier. Okay? One minute, 43 seconds. I'm watching. Okay? Uh, this is a blog which is current. This was some work that they had done just before Christmas. And one of the things that they can do is embed things such as ThingLink into their own blog. And these are some of the tools that we've used over the years. It's not all the tools, but it's some of them. And some of the tools we still use to this day, other tools we've ditched and we haven't used for years, and then we come back and use them again. And one interesting story, again, real life setting, is the use of, uh, can you see in the middle, it says Powtoon. Yeah? It's, Powtoon is kind of like Microsoft PowerPoint, but on speed, and it's free. And one day, there was a little boy in my class called Owen, and we were doing, a presenta we were doing presentations on Friday afternoon, and everybody in the class was using their Google account, apart from one. His name was Owen. And Owen, like Ryan, doesn't like writing. And he doesn't like school either. 
and he wasn't very happy. But he was the only kid in the whole class who was using something called Powtoon, which I'd never seen before in my life. And I asked him, I said, how oh, did you find Powtoon? He said, oh, I was searching around my Google account, found it on the Play Store, installed it into my uh, drive, and it's easy to use. So I got him to stand up and explain to the rest of the class uh, how you use Powtoon, which he did do. And that was Friday. Over the weekend, I went onto YouTube, found a little YouTube clip which said, this is how you use Powtoon. And the following week, we did exactly the same. Well, we've got another little boy in the class called Phoenix. Phoenix liked Powtoon, went home to his mum, who runs a business, a learning business. And now if you go onto Phoenix's mum's website, the business has their training videos done in Powtoons. And again, it's this idea of the digital world if you offer children the opportunity, it goes from the classroom, well, it didn't go from the classroom, it went from home into the classroom, out of the classroom, into business, all because Owen, the little boy doesn't like school and he doesn't like writing, managed to find something that interested and excited him and he's ended up in a business, you know, as part of a, a real business, okay? Uh, oh, this was really good. We started with Zoe's. We started with Zoe's, Zoe Ross's, and Lily. And this happened just a few, uh, just a couple of months ago. And this guy called John Bidder in the UK, he does, he's an app inventor. He makes apps, mobile apps, and things like that. Came into school, and he wanted to just have a wander around. And I didn't tell the teachers, because they get fed of me of asking people to come around and have a look and see what they're doing with techie stuff. So I didn't say anything, so nothing was planned. Nobody knew, and we just wandered around the school. And he ended up in year three. This is our current year three class. That's Coral. Can you see on the right-hand side of the picture, that's Coral. She's our fabulous year three teacher. And she's a newly qualified teacher. And sometimes I only have to say to Coral, why don't you try? And next day, she's trying it with technology. She is a person who gives it a go. And if it all goes wrong, it sort of kind of like all goes wrong. And she'll try something else. And it's a really good approach to have. But she, uh, John came into Coral's class. And there's the class there. They're working on their Chromebooks over there. Easy to carry around. You don't have to be in a computer suite. Um, and the work that they produced from that day when John came in was absolutely fabulous. And the interesting thing that he wrote on his blog, click on the link, you'll find it, and we were inspected by somebody called, by an organization called Ofsted. If you've encountered Ofsted in Estonia, I pity you. Ofsted come to, <laughs> Ofsted, Ofsted come to inspect you and find things, fault in things that you wouldn't believe they could find fault in, but they do. But the interesting thing that John said about Ofsted was if they walked in now unannounced, where would they put themselves and how would they begin to understand what was going on? Because sometimes Ofsted come and Ofsted haven't got a grip on the digital world which is outside. And he asked the question, what was happening? Uh, so which way? Okay, come back to the picture, the um, North by Northwest picture, which way? Well, we've had pictures this week of the old fashioned classrooms and the new classrooms, and they're not much different. I kind of like to see education and educational technology as being a bit of um, a journey. And kind of like in the old-fashioned days, when people went to work on their journey, they would read papers in the way that you would sit in your old-fashioned classrooms. Well, I reckon things have changed a little bit, because now if you go on the underground, you get exactly the same situation, but using different devices. And again, it goes back to that picture. Now, that picture showed right at the beginning, the uninterested ones. If you see, if that's your class, there's the, see the one, two, three, four from the left, you've got first one interested, second one interested, third one interested, fourth one is just dead bored. It's kind of like, look around your class, there's always somebody dead bored, no matter what you're doing. And the end couple having a conversation. Yeah. Um, I don't, don't know if I've got time to show you. I'm quite lucky. I've got this is my grandson, Charlie. And my own kids are 32, 20, 32, 30, and 26. This is Charlie's. My grandson, when this film was taken, he was 16 months old. And often, and I was asked the question by Laura. There's a journalist going around called Laura. And, and Laura asked me, do you think, how young do you think children should be before they start using technology? Well, this is Charlie when he was 16 months old. And you can see in the film... And you can see in the film that he's used iPads before because he knows what he's doing. And I use Charlie not because he's my grandson, although he is my grandson, and I do love him and all that kind of stuff, but more because children of 16 months old, this is what they are doing with the devices that they have got. So if I just um, click on that, you can see Charlie and his iPad. And I just find this quite illuminating. 
I'm sorry for going over. So this is Charlie. This is Charlie. Okay. So he's got his iPad. He can scroll through apps. He knows. That he likes to close the lid as well. Just like like that, and open it again. Uh, and he can go through his apps to find the things that he wants. He knows the home button. He knows if he presses the home button and gets Siri, it doesn't do anything, because he can't talk yet. So he goes back to the home, and he starts scrolling through. You'll see that again. When he sees the, car, the keyboard, he will start plonking his fingers on the keyboard, because that's what you do. There you go. Okay, and he goes on like that. He eventually finds an app that he's interested that he's interested with. I'll just stop that one there because the next shorter film is a film of my youngest son. That's Luke. There you can see Luke, and he's sitting next to Charlie. And this is now when Charlie is. That's Luke. is 26 years. Not Charlie. It's not. We've not skipped 23 years. Luke is 26 years and Charlie is 30 months. And you can see the difference in the way that Charlie uses the iPad now. He's much more particular, he's much more precise. And you can also see the way that Luke uses the phone. And I find it quite an interesting comparison of young and old uses of technology in the way that they uh, do. So if you just bear with me. And the telly's on in the background. But you can see his fingers are much more precise. And it's like little Charlie and big Charlie, both with digital devices. Look, look. <laughs> and, I, and as I say, I use these as examples, not because they're my own children, because this is what is going on from that age to that age to that age. And the very last thing, sorry to sort of get rid of that, and the very last thing I suspect, and this comes back to um, the guy from Boston and your phrase, uh, lava. lava, your phrase lava. And one thing that we, t one thing, I came across a lady called Monica. Monica is a, an IT pedagogue from Sweden. And she was describing a book in Sweden which talks about fire stones. No, but it didn't. She t I thought she said fire stones. It was fire souls. But I'm taking it as fire stones. And it comes back to this thing about technology. And it comes back to this thing of why we are here today. And the idea of Firestones is that people like you who have given up your time, and yes, I know you're not all on holiday, and yes, I know, you've, you know sometimes you get paid to come, things like that. Nonetheless, you're here to find out about technology. And Firestones are people who are the people who go back to their schools and talk about technology and persuade and guide and help and support the people back in their own school who feel a little bit reluctant about technology. And you may be here for 101 different reasons. You may be here because you're interested. You may be here because it's a Friday off and you can just, uh, instead of teaching kids all day, you can come here and listen to people talk. But nonetheless, you've come here for a reason. And if you go away today from this conference, like my use of App Inventor, take one thing with you, go back to your school and use that one idea back in your school because it will make a difference. Thank you very much and thank you. Sorry for going over time. Yeah, thank you, Peter. <laughs> And very short answers. Yes, very short. I, t I did say right at the very beginning my classes yeah. tend to go on quite a little bit. Anne Willems from Tartu University. Hi. Uh, your children graduate your school. At 11. Uh, and then they go to another school. Yes. What they will do there? What do they do? Not very much. <laughs> Seriously, no, because this year they have Google accounts in our school and Google accounts allows them to work in school and work at home. When they go to the secondary school, they don't have that facility. So two years ago, once our children had left our school, I deleted all their Google accounts. Last year, I didn't. And if I go into the Google accounts now, today, now, this minute, I know that about half of them will have used their Google account in the last week or so. The secondary school is doing something about it. But they go from there to there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Niin, yksi kysymys vielä. That's it. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Wonderful speech. Can anything go wrong? Yeah, things often do. <laughs> But some, some, right, some, 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 some hints. Um, Maybe you should try things uh, so that you can learn from going wrong. Or what would be your yeah, suggestion? When we started our blog, when we started our blog, I can remember. I, I brought with me two little. I, I brought. I've left them in my coat pockets, and I was going to use these two little. You know the aliens from Toy Story. You know the aliens from Toy Story. When we started our blog, if you remember the first Toy Story film, where they're in the um, the machine, where the claw comes down, and all these little aliens look up and go, "Ooh," that's what we were like with our blog because it opened up a world to us. Okay, and our teacher skills. They found to begin with, you know, like you write an email. All you needed to do was be able to write an email because that was the same as blogging kind of thing. And once teachers had started to find out that things were as easy as that, that's when it exploded. When things go wrong, one thing went wrong, um, particularly our, that blog that you see now for our school is two years old, and it's two, uh, rather than 10 years old. And the previous eight years content and history of our school went because we made a mistake. We get all the parents to sign a form to say that their children can appear, their faces can appear. If the parent says no, we don't put their picture on the, on the blog, okay? We made a mistake. We included a picture of one little boy whose mum was, is this broadcast to the internet? Yeah. Oh, right, better not say that. <laughs> um, whose mum objected to him being gone. And we ploughed through every single picture on our blog to see if we had put a picture on, and we couldn't we couldn't guarantee that we got rid of everybody so we closed the whole of the eight years blog down it no longer is in existence and now we started up a new blog which is a shame but it was a mistake